Hello, everyone, and welcome to our panel. Uh, this is Whose Role Is It Anyway? Understanding the Requirement of Diversity in the, green, in the New Green Frontier. Um, I will be your moderator. My name is Rosibel Tavares. I am a Community Energy Advisor under NYSERDA's Community Energy Engagement Program at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, a uh, housing nonprofit based in New York City. Um, and speaking of which, uh, we're going to start off the conversation about lack of diversity in the energy sector and sustainability, as well as um, how to increase inclusivity uh, by giving a little background and uh, providing some context as to why we're having this discussion today. And I want to bring it back to New York City. Um, as most of you all know, New York City is the most diverse and populous city in the whole country. Uh, over 3 million New York City residents uh, are foreign born and half of those speak a language other than English in their home. Uh, and what turns out is that 64% of New York City residents self-identify as people of color. In contrast, however, when you look at the demographics of uh, those who work within the sustainability sector and the energy field, um, it's not representative of that population or that demographic um, in the very least. Uh, so one study uh, has indicated that within environmental agencies such as uh, US con uh, conservation and preservation organizations, uh, government environmental agencies, as well as environmental grant making uh, foundations, um, only 16% of board members as well as staff members um, identify as people of color. And additionally, another report found that within American environmental nonprofit organizations, 80% of board members and 85% of staff members were men and the majority were white. Uh, so there is clearly a dichotomy between uh, the population and who is representing uh, that population and the demographics between the two. So the question that arose for us is, uh, why are people of color not being represented in every sector that influences change? Um, and we can see that there is a clear lack of representation and inclusion of black and indigenous people of color uh, within the energy sector in New York, as well as sustainability organizations across the state uh, and the city as well. Um, and we believe that in order to maximize energy solutions in low income and marginalized communities, uh, methodologies of inclusion, uh, true inclusion must change. Uh, so this panel will provide insight from women of color who have radically changed the status quo by creating pathways to include underrepresented populations at the table. And I wanna add as well that with uh, COVID, all these, problems have exacerbated and we're seeing less representation and less inclusion uh, with all the ramifications of the pandemic. Uh, so we found that we think it's very important to elevate this conversation uh, because in order to meet all the goals that we've set out as a state and as a city uh, to mitigate and abate climate change, it is necessary for it to be just and inclusive. Uh, so without further ado, I want to, uh, introduce our uh, panelists. Uh, first, we have Daphne Rose Sanchez. She is the Executive Director of Kinetic Communities Consultant. Uh, we also have Christina Garcia, who's the Assistant Director of Building Electrification Initiative. And we also have Shante Harris, who is a co-founder of Women of Color Collective in Sustainability. So I'm gonna pass it on over to our esteemed panelists to introduce themselves and also tell you a little bit more about who they are and what they do. So first, um, let's start with Daphne. Thank you so much, Rosie. Hi, everyone. My name is Daphne Rose Sanchez. She, her pronouns. I'm the Executive Director of Kinetic Communities Consulting. I'm based here in New York City. Our firm is the first minority and women benefit corporation really focused on energy equity design. For me, this is very important. Um, our work really focuses on the intersection of housing and energy with a specific focus on equitable design. And so what does that mean? It means that every time the city or state has an opportunity to do energy efficiency, to do clean energy upgrades and clean energy programming, that it is being done in a way that is mindful of communities of color, of immigrant populations and frontline 
folks to make sure that the programming and the design and the implementation is inclusive and it is supporting local economic development and it is supporting intergenerational wealth. So I'm, I'm grateful to have you all here. Uh, I'm excited to have a conversation with Shantae, Christina, and Rosie today on this very important topic. Christina, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, um, and thanks for having me. I'm Christina Garcia. Um, as Rosie mentioned, I am the Assistant Director at uh, the Building Electrification Initiative. I also, outside of my nine to five, I um, founded a group called Latinos in Sustainability. And the purpose of that group is um, to connect the few Latinos that are in the sustainability space in New York City. Um, it's also to inform other uh, engineers or STEM professionals in New York City about what careers in sustainability look like and what's going on in New York City in terms of sustainability. But most importantly, it's to inform, educate, and, and excite um, students, uh, college students in particular, and young professionals about career opportunities in sustainability, what career trajectories have typically looked like. Uh, the purpose of this group is really to kind of break that idea that um and what i think happens in new york city which is if you're not part of this like well-connected network then you're not going to have access or hear about these jobs and so this group is trying to kind of connect the dots and bring that information and that access to students that typically have been disengaged and left out of the communications thanks for having me I'll just go ahead and jump in. Hi, Shante Harris here. I've worked as a go-to-market strategist for now about four and a half years, um, particularly looking at sustainable and clean tech technologies uh, throughout the city, uh, helping founders uh, as well as growth stage ventures and established companies think about how do they expand in the New York market. Um, so that's looked like everything from uh, advancing pilot projects, design challenges, taking advantage of public procurement opportunities coming out of New York City and New York State, um, some with NYSERDA for sure, given all of the commitment to R&D. Um, and then as a result of my efforts and just, you know, to be pretty frank, noticing how oftentimes I was the only woman and the only person of color in the room decided to found uh, the Women of Color Collective and Sustainability, which goes by Wokesus for short, um, alongside my amazing co-founder, Jordi Vasquez. And we've been operating now for a little bit over a year and or about a year and a half, actually. Um, in light of COVID, we've sort of went from this kind of smaller community in New York to a really large global virtual community, which is really exciting. Um, I think it shows the need for what we're building. And, you know, at the at the crux of it is really how do we make sure that women of color who do exist in this industry have the support, the opportunities, the mentorship that they need to really uh, work not only within organizations um, and companies, but also start their own if they want to and, and see them Kind of rise up the ranks and, and really be uh, trailblazers in the industry. So happy to be here with friends um, and talk about such a great topic. So thanks for having us. Thank you all uh, for sharing and for your introductions. And without further ado, we're just going to jump straight into the questions. And the first question I have is, why is it important to engage Black, Indigenous, and people of color, as well as local communities, into sustainability uh, programming and initiatives, as well as the energy sector? Um, and I'll start with you, Daphne, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Thank you. The reason why it's important to engage BIPOC communities, frontline communities, immigrant communities, is because the diversity in those communities is really important to addressing climate action. A lot of times when we talk about energy efficiency, we're talking about it with a single lens. What is our kilowatt reductions? What are our therm reductions? And how do we get to this net zero goal by 2050? And often in this acceleration of getting to this goal, we kind of lose sight that climate change and energy efficiency and all of this is not a single single point issue. There are multi-dimensional issues that influences our energy efficiency um, engagement, the way we interact with energy, the way energy is being used. And it's often forgot because the lack of diverse perspective is in that room when they're designing policy, when they're designing program and when they're implementing it. And that lack of diversity 
winds up leading to policy failure, program failure, and just the scrambling of, okay, that idea doesn't work. Let's nix it and let's do something else. I think we need to kind of take a step back and saying, okay, if we are all coming up with the same idea, if us four came up with the same idea, then we actually need somebody with a different perspective in this room, right? If we have someone, and that's what we're recommending for everyone in the sector to do is kind of take that step back, understanding that energy is not a single faceted issue, that it is a multifunctional issue that influences health, it influences um, socioeconomics, it influences mental, um, mental status and behavior. And understanding all of those different areas and, and the value that BIPOC communities can bring in on that diverse perspective and, and the, not only the value, but the, um, the, um, the substance of what they're giving you is going to be way more important than just conducting your programs and policies in the same way you've been doing it since 1972. Yeah, I'd love to jump in. Um, I totally agree with, with Daphne's point. And I think that in general, organizations need to see diversity as an opportunity and as a strength rather than like a chore or something um, or, or like a barrier to success because it's really, it's really if anything, an accelerant to success, I think. The other thing I, 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 I think that especially in a place like New York, I mean, the country as a whole is really diversifying um, it's, 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 dem it's demographics, but I think in general, New York is already so diverse and organizations that their mission is to protect the environment and therefore the health, um, you know, of the places, of, of the, of the places that they serve, I think should look like the places that they serve. And, and New York is, is a perfect example. We have, we're extremely diverse. And so our organizations that are here to serve us should should be as, as diverse as well. Yeah, and I'll just briefly add, I think, um, yes, double click on what Christina and Daphne just mentioned. Um, and I think building off of what Christina just mentioned, I, I talk a lot about how I think we, we don't, we don't acknowledge that there's not that ROI and impact are mutually exclusive. And so I, um, I mean, I've seen it firsthand from literally consulting with companies that are trying to grow in this market. You are, you miss out on a, a key customer segment when you don't think about every community. Um, and the beautiful thing about cities and particularly New York is that it is so diverse, right? Which means you have a lot of different personas and customers to go after. Um, but if you aren't cognizant, right, if you aren't thoughtful about who those customers are, how you engage with them, you're not only, you know, not having an impact from uh, whether that be a community in uh, perspective, but also when you're looking at how are you actually meeting your revenue goals and your business goals and how are you advancing your business model. And so, um, you know, I, I think I'll be excited for the day where that kind of comes as common knowledge instead of me feeling like I have to consistently say it as, um, yeah, kind of beating a dead horse. <laughs> um, but I think the nice thing is that over my past, over the past few years, I've seen that there um, is more of an inclination. And, you know, I will say there's also kind of a global aspect to this. Some of the companies I work with are coming from Europe and, you know, don't even understand sort of U.S. demographics and uh, cities. And so I, I think it's, it's not pointing them out specifically, but I think that's where government and, you know, agencies like NYSERDA can play a role in really helping people understand why it's important to service every key customer in every uh, community and, and not overlooking or simply taking taking what you've learned from another market and thinking you can apply it here. I think everything has to be local and everything has to be hyper-local. Thank you all. And I'm going to jump right into the second question and I'm going to direct this one to you, Christina. Uh, what are barriers that you see that are impeding these communities from participating in the industry? Sure. Um, I, I think there's, there's two things. I think that a lot of organizations have focused a lot on like, okay, let's, you know, we know that there's a problem. I think that everyone has, has come to terms that there is a lack of diversity. And I think their focus tends to be on increasing the number of people of color hired instead of looking at what the root cause of why that number is so low to begin with um, or why there is turnover, right? Why companies are not, um, you know, retaining those people of color. So I think in terms of upfront barriers, there's definitely unconscious bias in terms of hiring. Um, as I said before, there's this kind of 
closed circle of like networks and unless you're part of it, you're not even gonna know about the job opening. Um, I think that there have been, you know, internships and like requiring experience that sometimes hasn't been paid that can be a limitation for people um i think that requiring certain degrees some level like certain level of education that can become a barrier for people um so i think that there's a lot of like where you where you promote job openings like are you going to just the ivy leagues and the private schools in your area are you going to the like the local community colleges the local you know, um, four-year colleges in, in especially in New York where there's plenty, you know, SUNYs and CUNYs. Um, so I think that that upfront kind of uh, hiring process has a lot of flaws um, that I think organizations really like need to look inside themselves and see like, what are we doing? What, what are we doing wrong? How are we not open, you know, broadening um, kind of like the outreach as much as possible? And then in terms of retention, I think that if, you know, if, if said company has, has done kind of part one, which is hire a person of color, have they put the work in to make sure that it's an inclusive environment so that that person feels comfortable, you know, and wants to stay there? Because it's it's really a twofold thing. It's not so much, it's not only getting them in the door, but it's keeping them in the door and making sure that all of, all of, you know, that structures are in place to, to bring them up to speed if that's what's necessary, to create a culture of inclusivity, um, to be understanding that people have different thoughts, as 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 Daphne said, like, and and that that's a great thing, that that's a welcomed and appreciated thing. Um, so just really nurturing that, uh, and, and I think the list goes on. There's you know many types of ways to you know make sure that making sure that there's no microaggressions or, or making sure that there's structure in place to be held accountable for those. Um, I think there's plenty, but I think it really is just focusing on kind of your hiring practices and what barriers you maybe unconsciously have put in place that close your circle and keep it as it is, um, and then making an inclusive culture once uh, once you have hired someone. Yeah, and I like to add, like on the programming side, the barriers that are created are barriers that are created because there's a lack of diversity in the program design space, um, and I utilize program design specifically in the energy efficiency, looking at multifamily programs or residential programs, a lot of the applications are one language, they're only in English. Or, you know, if you want to go through weatherization, you're required to provide your social security number. It's like, what is my social security number? What does my immigration status have to do with my energy consumption? Like they're not interrelated and you are creating these fake barriers just because they do want to get this information or that information. And then the issue is that folks in the program design world will say, well, why aren't people applying for this? Like we want low income folks to apply to this. It's like, why do we have to give you our social? Why do we have to learn, you know, how to decipher this eight page application? Why do I have to go to another place that is not the place that I normally go to for my food stamps and my Medicaid? just to like receive these benefits and just to receive these programmings that we're paying for. Like these are taxpayer dollars in the state of New York. It comes out of our utility bills and you're creating a crazy amount of barriers for us and for low income folks and for frontline communities. They can't, they can't afford to get a consultant or a organization to do all of this front work for them to figure out, you know, they cannot use their contractor that they normally use. They have to use an approved contractor from a utility or from the state, which is going to charge them five to eight times more than the contractor that's from the neighborhood that has been doing the work, plumbing work in their building for decades. So understanding these kind of I don't even know what to call them, but like these abstract barriers that are created that again, one size fit all. And this is how programs have always run. So why do we have to change it now is the issue on the program side. The, the, when you start addressing the fundamentals on how you program design, what are the perspectives in there? Then you'll start to see why is it that low income communities, people of color, frontline Im immigrant populations are not participating in these programming. Yeah, and I'll add that um, on the business side, right? I think Daphne alluded to this. I mean, I think anyone who's looked at procurement probably cries for the first time, right? It's not an easy process to navigate. 
um, it's, if you've never seen it before, it can be really overwhelming. And I think, um, you know, we're talking about innovation, a startup ecosystem, the fact that women of color are, you know, starting businesses at a rate faster than any other demographic in the country, particularly in New York. Um, but then when we look at the existing processes and procedures, they, they don't account for that, right? And so when you think about a small business, um, they don't, to Daphne's point, have the ability to hire someone, right? They don't have the, uh, the, the, the budget line for that. And so uh, you're asking a founder or a small business owner to spend hours reviewing this 100 page page document, navigating it, going to a pre-proposal conference, going to another conference, um, and then oftentimes there's not even transparency around sort of how the decision's being made or, you know, it, was this sort of a pre-designed, um, you know, pr either program or offering for someone else. And so I think, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different layers here, but I mean, let's start with acknowledging what the unique challenges are for diverse vendors and people that I think all agencies say they want to work with, but the processes don't reflect that. So um, I think that's a, a really huge challenge that we have to, we have to adequately address. Thank you all. And I think you all provided me with the perfect segue into my next question. Um, I know everyone just touched on hiring practices and how to be more inclusive in hiring people of color. Um, but what, uh, what would you all suggest organizations could do to promote uh, people of color and staff of color from progressing further than just the entry level positions, uh, because we have found that there is a lack of representation and leadership and hierarchical roles within these organizations. Um, so I'll start with you, Shante. What are your thoughts on that? Sure, my favorite question. <laughs> um, I think, you know, it starts with transparency. I mean, we know it's not, it, we have the numbers, so they're not a surprise, right? Rosie read them earlier. I think they're really disheartening and really unfortunate for a place that looks like New York. So like, let's kind of start with acknowledging that that's where we are right now. Let's also acknowledge that we're talking about an industry, a movement that disproportionately impacts the same people who are left out of the leadership decisions, right? And so what does that mean in terms of actually creating solutions that are going to be multifaceted, that are going to be nuanced, that are going to actually meet the needs of multiple communities. Um, and so I think when we talk about, you know, how do, how do companies, how do organizations actually elevate people of color? I mean, do it, right? Like, uh, that's the easy answer. But, you know, in terms of actual steps, I think it's really understanding that you have to have real pathways for people. And I think a big part of that is transparency. The reality is that people who look like me are getting entry level jobs, but they're not staying there, right? And so asking the question of why aren't they staying there? Um, or if they do decide to stay there, you know, why are they, you know, perhaps staying in the same role longer than their white male counterparts, right? And so what are what are the benchmarks, right? And who's in charge of that process? And, and are you all being honest and transparent about what it looks like to actually move people up the ladder that don't look like you? And I think that's where we kind of get back to the conversation around unconscious bias and uh, sponsorship and mentorship within an organization and company. And it has to be deliberate. It can't be, I think the way we talk about it, particularly in the corporate, on the corporate side of things is like, you as a, as a person who's in this org should go find a sponsor. When in reality, it's like, no, the org and the company should be making sure that they have deliberate processes to match people, right? And match people who maybe folks wouldn't talk to, right? But I mean, we've all worked for a company. It's really easy to get caught in the middle of your day or just, you know, in all of the things that you have to do. And so if companies aren't providing incentives to, to actually make sure that those things are happening, then we won't see it happen. And then I think it also comes down to hiring, right? Like the network piece is huge. I think there's oftentimes this excuse that the pipeline doesn't exist. And it's just not true, right? I mean, we're talking about New York here. Mm -hmm. There are a number of academic institutions. We all attended, right? Academic institutions that are well known and that people know about, right? There's an entire like very strong CUNY, SUNY system that I know is really dedicated to bringing uh, in students that reflect the demographics of the city and the state. And so, you know, how are we making sure that when those people graduate, right, or even when they're five or 10 years out, that we're still using that ecosystem to place them in roles um, of power, right? And so I think, um, you know, it's, it's, we have to do it and we have to be transparent about it. And, you know, it all, it ultimately comes down to actually putting processes in place 
and not just having folks stay in the same role with the same decision making process, or excuse me, decision making power for years. Yeah, I mean, I echo all of that. That was so well said. I, I would just want to like uh, reiterate the importance of um, of really just looking at the root of the problem. Companies really need to understand like and also see value of diversifying their leadership. Like that's also part of it. It's not just getting entry level, you know, diversifying their entry level staff. It's finding that this is an opportunity and an accelerant to success to diversify their leadership. And I think understanding the root of the problem, why aren't, you know, why aren't people of color growing at the rate that others have been? Well, I think that's on you, the decision maker that allows people to grow. So, and makes a decision of when, you know, when you move on to the next level, et cetera. So I think it's all about um, accountability and, and transparency. Yeah, and I like to add on the program side, a lot of times kind of like what's an entry level is seen as like community engagement. And so folks would traditionally engage like nonprofit organizations and folks that are on the ground just for that aspect, but really giving those organizations the tools to grow their organ their capacity to learn about the technology because if, again if we really need to get by to this goal by 2050 every single one of us every single one of them needs to know it like we can't just wait for one large company or one small company that's niche to do every single building in new york city and every single building in the entire country it's not going to happen we need all hands on deck which means we need to equip every single um organization out there with the right tools so that they independently can do it without this the the kind of saving grace that people are often trying to to play thank you all again for all your insights and i think i want to um pose this question and frame it around accountability um, which we know can be a real issue. And the question I have is, how do we create a framework for accountability to determine whether NYSERDA's processes are equitable? I, I could just take a quick pass. Um, I, I think that in general, there's, there's a lot of funding opportunities. And I think a structure for accountability is just really tracking, you know, if if underserved communities is our priority and it should be, then is our funding going to them, right? It's not enough to, I think, have funding, that's definitely step one, um, but is the funding going to the people that we actually want it to go to in terms of like training dollars? Like, are we training, you know, minority owned businesses and are we helping local businesses? Are we training, are we training local people? Like, are we investing those dollars where we know they need to be invested? Um, and are we keeping track of that? If they're not going in the places that we intended them to go to, again, uh, kind of like looking at the root of the problem and being transparent about it um, and, and then and addressing it so that those dollars do go to the, to the hands of the right people. Yeah, and to add to that is like it, it kind of harping on the transparency is when there are procurement opportunities and program design opportunities, like what are, what are your thought processes and what are your unconscious bias, meaning like what are your pre, pre-existing assumptions of organizations, whether they're nonprofits or small businesses, that you are imposing and creating additional barriers for them to obtain a contract versus a larger firm that you have this assumption that they can do it, even though that they, they have no virtual presence in New York City and they really don't understand the different demographics. So it is very important not only to kind of invest resources within the community, but making sure that 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 the resources are not just given to them, but the space for that capacity support and that organizational support for them to grow is a part of that solution. And really looking at it as the same way as you look at a tech investment, right? You, for a passive house, you create a line item of like, okay, we understand that creating this exoskeleton for the building is gonna cost X amount of dollars. We also, on the next item on the list is like, we understand ensuring that the NWBE contractors in the neighborhood that can use, that can purchase this material from the local supplier will cost X amount of dollars. Like that's how you begin to equitably think about program design and implementation for energy efficiency. If you're not going into every single little detail of 
what materials are being used, who's installing that, where is the material coming from, you're not gonna be able to turn that the dial on equity. Yeah, and I think building off of Daphne's point around investment, you know, I think something that I think a lot about is, you know, there, especially in ICERTA, there's so many pilot projects that come out and I see time and time again, how many of them go to firms that are, you know, either not based in New York, not based in the US. Um, and, you know, I, I think, yes, you know, Eastern Europe has a, a huge bustling clean tech hub, but at the same time, I, you know, at some point it, be go, it becomes, how do we actually create some of those solutions here in New York and how do we do that with New Yorkers, right? And so, again, alluding to what Daphne just said, it's not just investment in terms of, you know, we're investing in this, this tech solution or this innovative idea, but, you know, we're also investing in jobs, local jobs and, and economic, uh, you know, uh, mobility and upward economic mobility for communities and people, particularly right now in light of COVID, who really, really need it, right, who also are here, right, like Eastern European folks might not be here anymore, they might be working from home wherever they are, but we're talking about people who are, who have been here for decades, who are committed to New York, who don't have anywhere else to go, but, you know, also have the time and the ability to both build these solutions as well as scale them. And so I think you know, it's pretty disheartening to look at, particularly in my space, the innovation ecosystem, and you just don't see diversity at all. I mean, it's not even, you know, maybe here or there, like you just do not see it, right? And, you know, with without saying names, I think everyone who's listening to this will know exactly who I'm alluding to. And so I think a, a big role that I've thought, or big thing that I've thought about is like, what would it look like for an ICERDA to actually one, find founders, particularly women of color founders, happy to support you with this, like, right, that are building solutions in this clean tech urban innovation space, and then actually go out and not only, you know, recruit them for R&D opportunities, but, you know, have this existing database so that it lives there. And that there, I will say that there is an overemphasis on making sure they know about all of the different incentives that exist. And so that's not just from NYSERDA. I don't think it's, this is just a NYSERDA issue. But, you know, there are so many tax incentives, real estate incentives that so many people don't know about. And I know because I get told about them and I get told that nobody's using them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, or that it's not at capacity, right? And so what would it look like to actually find people who could really benefit from those, use them, and that there's an intentionality in how we build programs moving forward and who we build them for? Yeah, that intentionality is so key. It's mm -hmm. like, if you're designing them just to design them and you're like, it's going to be a, a, a catch all, right? Let's see who comes to us. Then it's being designed incorrectly. The moment that you're like, we'll see what we get. That's when you need to tell yourself, wait a minute, what am I doing wrong? Because it shouldn't be, you know, let's see what you get. It should be, we're really trying to create a restorative justice model where we're helping black and brown communities to regain the wealth that has been stolen from them um, because of structural racism. And so making sure that your programs are being intentional and redistributing that wealth is um, essential for our climate carbon free future or net zero future, whatever you guys want to call it now, which I feel like every other month it's a new thing. So. Yeah, and sorry, the last thing I'll say is just, I think it also relates to deployment of products, right? Um, and I mean, I this still blows my mind. I mean, I think the lovely thing about sustainability and the opportunity here is that it doesn't have to be this kind of, you know, business against community. I mean, we're all trying to make communities more sustainable, resilient, you know, local as it relates to economy. And so I, there's a really neat, like overlap here that we can actually take advantage of. And so, you know, I'm happy I've been able to do that with, you know, the, the companies that I work with, whether that be early stage or growth stage or established. But, you know, I, I realized early on when I started doing this work that I was really the only one talking about it this way or understanding that there was real value in doing both. But, you know, it would be great to see NYSERDA, you know, really own that narrative and say, hey, you know, we're not, we're not only doing this because it's, you know, going to create local community impact, but also when you, when you go to deploy products, you're literally going to people's communities and deploying products and some of the areas where, yes, these solutions are needed the most, but there's not any previous discourse about 
about who these communities are. There's not an understanding of them as personas or just mm -hmm. as people. And, you know, then we, we have what I feel is a lot of time and missed opportunity missed or a lot of missed opportunities simply because now there's kind of this conflict that I think honestly, if we were more proactive, we'd see a lot less of and a lot more impactful initiatives and projects. Um, and so, you know, that's what I'm excited for. And I think when we talk about accountability, like that is how NYSERDA, other agencies, um, you know, can really think about not only bringing in businesses that are mission aligned, but then uh, growing them meaningfully and also supporting communities across the board. Yeah, sorry to keep my time on it. So oh, true because I feel like half the time a lot of the programs that I've seen that are designed and implemented on the pilot stage like we'll have this you know organization coming out of Finland or Denmark with this idea that's never been piloted before in New York City are building typology or old building steam systems but yet you know they're willing to fund this idea and it's innovative just because they're from another state. But when you have an organization or a business or a company or a nonprofit that has been doing community engagement, that has already built a trust with organizations that have been traditionally disinvested in, they have to prove themselves 10 times more to get one tenth of the funds that you have given to this other organization. And, and thinking about why is it that the programs are designed in that manner? Why is it that we're only giving organizations, you know, a hundred to three hundred thousand dollars to do four years worth of work, while other organizations for a six-month pilot, we're throwing two million, three million, four million dollars at it without even understanding the demographics, without even understanding the differentiation of one neighborhood, one block to another, the differentiation from a steam pipe to a hydronic system. Like they don't understand the basics building typology, but we're willing to give them money so that they can learn while other organizations that already know, we need them to prove to us why, why shall we give them, you know, a fraction of the funds. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, no, go ahead, Shantae. No, go I'm ahead. Not. I just wanted to double click on all of that. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll snap to all of that, too. And I think um, in this discussion, every single one of you have touched on real tangible initiatives and um, ideas to really make this sector equitable. And I think in light of uh, what has happened in the last few months um, with kind of this, uh, this push for racial equity across the board, we've seen a lot of performative statements, including in our own sector um, in the state of New York and energy and sustainability. So the last question that I have for each and, one of, each and um, every single one of you is, how uh, do we move from performative statements to actionable items that actually have real impact and move the and move the movement forward? And uh, I'll start with Daphne. Release power and redistribute wealth. Um, I mean, in 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 the in the in the lens of of programming and program design and implementation is understanding where you sit with your privilege in designing these programs and taking that a step back and saying wait a minute like how do i make sure that this program is more inclusive even if it's like you know a program where you need eight acres ten acres of land to do community solar and you're like this is such a big program or if you need to do and i'm not trying to call out specific programs but if you need to do you know wind you know a, a eight gigabytes of wind or whatever you need to do taking that step back and thinking about okay who are the folks that are influenced by this from the macro to the micro level in your mentality because the reality is the folks that live in those communities are always going to be impacted for generations like i can't tell you my my grandmother there used to be a um an oil tank near where i live and i live near a super fun site and she would tell me like she remembers that oil leaking and then people would just clean it up and it was an indicator for her of her neighborhood like she had a relationship with that in that relationship with energy efficient with energy in itself is not a direct relationship of energy on and off but it's a relationship of like a cultural experience that she's had in her community even though it's not a positive experience it's still an experience that needs to be front of mind when you're designing these programs because to you as someone who does program and design implementation, you're trying to create climate change, you're trying to fix the environment. To them, it's, it's a part of their everyday life and it's gonna be a part of the future generations as well. 
Yeah, I think from, from a workforce lens, I think that increasing the capacity to access to kind of opportunities in the field, um, and, and we, we've been saying the word intentional a lot, but it really is key, being intentional about creating those, that access and opportunities. Um, I'm, I'm going to butcher the saying, but it's like, it's, it's hard to be something that you cannot see. Um, we can't let that continue to be the barrier just because people of color are not seeing themselves, um, in roles in sustainability, definitely not in leadership roles. That doesn't mean that we, that it stops there. That means we have to be intentional about creating pipelines, programs, solutions to accelerate and create that those opportunities because they're clearly not coming naturally. And if we just continue business as usual, we'll continue to see the lack of diversity in this field. So again, it's it's about intentionality, um, about creating, and, and it, it's gonna cost money, but creating programs um, that allow this, this kind of new flow, this new, this change um, to occur and, and also requiring that that people start to to be accountable if you're if you're looking at this as a burden then that's something that needs to be addressed right everyone needs to be on board everyone needs to see this as an added opportunity as success as moving in the right direction um and yeah so transparency accountability intentionality buzzwords <laughs> Love that. Yes, on everything you just said, Christina. I think um, so many thoughts here. I feel like we already, in the last question, started to answer this question, uh, just in our going back and forth, Daphne and I. But I mean, I think something that came up for me when Daphne was talking is I realized a lot of what she was saying is sometimes the role I'll have to play in addition to like just thinking about go to market strategy and business strategy for businesses, because it's not it's not prioritized, right? And that's that's seen in how procurement's written and how pilot projects are written, how they're shared, how they're not shared, who knows about them, who, who doesn't. And I think um, moving forward, it'd be really nice to see like sort of these two components put together as opposed to being separate, even in like the actual request, right? Like what would it look like for us to have R&D that require an extensive you know, response to community engagement that require people identifying community engagement partners up front, as opposed to it only be about being about building a solution. What would it look like us for us to build and test products that require a real understanding of diverse personas before we start building them? And I think, you know, we would not only see more diversity in terms of who uses them, who wants to use them, but then also in terms of the features that are built. I mean, it's so expensive to build something and then go back and realize it's not working for an entire customer segment that you want to get in front of. And so it's, again, I feel like I have to harp on this over and over, but it's like these two things, are, I promise you are not mutually exclusive. And so I've seen it work firsthand and I, I'm excited for, you know, seeing agencies like NYSERDA, companies, organizations across the board, like actually being intentional about not having these things be one-offs, right? I mean, let's talk about the fact that like, even in discussions, right? Like it's almost like, okay, we'll talk about all these other things, mobility and agriculture and waste and energy and all these really exciting topics and how we're gonna move forward. But then we have one panel on equity and community. And it's like, no, like that, I mean, to me, that is moving the needle on accountability. All of, all of those topics involve community and equity. And so, you know, it's not these one-off discussions or, hey, we're going to bring one person on board or one consultant. It's like, how do we actually bake that into every single part of our operations? Because it makes sense. Also, because, you know, this is about serving New Yorkers, right? And, and being there to actually support and build, uh, whether that be workforce programs, initiatives, projects that actually move the needle for everyone here, right? And not just a certain uh, segment of the population or people who don't even, you know, identify as New Yorkers. So I think, um, you know, I think for me, accountability is like, how do we make sure that this is streamlined across the board and that, you know, I'm not just talking about it. Christina's not just talking about it. Daphne's not just talking about it. And Rosie's not just talking about it, but that you're talking about it and that, you know, you're, you're understanding that everyone needs to be talking about it all the time. And I'm excited because I've seen some amazing leaders, um, particularly over the past few weeks, 
really talk about that. But you know, if you have a pre-proposal conference and there's no diverse people in the room, then it's on you to go find them. It's on you to acknowledge that there's that gap and to be intentional about, you know, not just moving forward because you've set a timeline, but actually finding the people who reflect what New York looks like. And so I think that's, and when I think about accountability, it's, you know, it's, it's actually taking the time to say, hey, we're missing the mark. So what are we going to do right now? We're literally right now so that this doesn't keep happening. Um, and maybe that means slowing down the process. Um, but I don't think it should, you know, I think it's, you know, you could, you could literally after this discussion, go find vendors and make sure you have that list moving forward. And even if they don't show, you know, you could still reach out to them, but it's like starting with step one and not letting, I think to Christina's point, the like long-term, well, you know, this is, it just hasn't been done before, stop you from taking the initial step. Like we have to start somewhere and it needs to start literally right now, <laughs> so. Thank you all and before we end i would love for each of you to share where uh anyone who's interested could follow you um and your organization so i can start feel free to follow kinetic communities consulting on linkedin um and instagram uh, and then our email is info at kc3.nyc if you have any questions. It was a pleasure speaking with you all and sharing the space to talk about this critical need in the sector. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you can follow me, Latinos in Sustainability, uh, on Instagram. We also have a group on LinkedIn, so feel free to request and I will add you. Hi, uh, you can follow Wokesis um, on Instagram as well as and like us on LinkedIn. We also have a, uh, a LinkedIn group that you can join if you are a woman of color. It is exclusive to women of color. But if you want to send us opportunities, we do have a, um, a form that you can fill out and we'll add you to our newsletter, uh, which goes out uh, probably every month now um, and we'll include job opportunities, things that you think our community should know about. Um, and then we also have a Google group. Um, again, that's for women of color um, and allies, but we want to make sure that we're prioritizing women of color. Uh, so those are a few ways to get involved. And we also have a website. So if you go there, you'll, you'll see all the different ways to follow us and stay updated. It's uh, W-O-C-C-S.co, Wokesis.co. Perfect. Uh, I just really want to thank each and every single one of our panelists for being amazing and sharing their insights and expertise um, and for really paving the way and uh, pushing this forward for everyone who looks like us and everyone who doesn't look like the template that came before us. So with that, I again, thank you all and thank you for, thank you to everyone who tuned in and we hope you have a beautiful day. Have a good one. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for being.